Now, take a listen to this. Pacquiao goes to the left uppercut, misses, gets through with a left hand. Three, four punch combination in centre ring, and Hatton has no answer. Another left hand over the top from Pacquiao. This is brilliant. Great combinations, great speed, wonderful footwork from the man from the Philippines. Champion in five different weights, and showing us here just why he's achieved that rare, rare feat. Final half a minute of the second round, another lively round, slightly better round for Ricky Hatton. He has had success. Good shot to the body from Manny Pacquiao right beneath the left forearm of Hatton, a wide open gap, and he took it and pounded that shot in to the abdomen, almost made a dent in Hatton's stomach. And a left hand from Manny Pacquiao, and Ricky Hatton is out and flat on his back. The referee waves his arms, doesn't even start the count, and it is all over in the closing seconds of the second round, and there is great concern in the ring here for Ricky Hatton. He was hit by a big left hand, fell flat on his back, and he has been motionless since then. As Manny Pacquiao goes to a neutral corner to say a prayer, and even the cheers here are muted because Hatton looks to be in big trouble. Yeah, that was Mick Costello with myself and Richie Woodall ringside in May of 2009 in Las Vegas for Manny Pacquiao's brutal dismantling of British boxing idol Ricky Hatton. Anyway, it's book time now, and this is good. One for the ages. Pac-Man. Behind the scenes with Manny Pacquiao, the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. Published by DiCapo. Available now at 10.99 and written by American Gary Andrew Paul. It's not a dire cuttings job, trust me. It's not the work of a ridiculous fanboy. It's quality. Gary, I'm delighted to say, is on the line now. Good afternoon, Gary. Hi, nice uh, to be on the show. Yeah, sorry to keep you waiting so long. We were celebrating something. Gary, how much time did you spend with the Pacquiao's or the Pac-Man team in preparing this book? Uh, I spent spent quite a bit of time with them. I uh, you know I watched him train, had dinners with him. I went over to the Philippines, watched him him campaign for 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 Congress, uh, and uh, so I so I got quite a bit of time to to observe the 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 wacky world of of Manny Pacquiao. And it does seem wacky because I mean I've seen him quite a few times now. I think four times or three times or five times live. I'm not quite sure. And it seems to me that there's a bigger or a swelling or a crazier entourage each time I see him. Is that fair comment, Gary? Oh yeah. I mean I think it I think it might might number in the hundreds of his entourage. I mean and you have people doing you know from carrying his exercise mat to uh, to holding his water. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, he 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 has a has a has a lot of people around him, and uh, he seems to like it that way. I think he likes the chaos of 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 you know of, of his life. Uh, he he grew up so poor, and yeah. I think I I think he you know I think he wants the people around to, to keep him keep him company. I mean, what you write about when he was growing up uh, is enforced in the book by the pictures of him as a small boy in the various gyms in uh, the Philippines and when he was a small boy, oh, sorry, I say a small boy, he was probably a man, when he was a very tiny, tiny man. Now, did it shock you just how harsh his background was? Because, we've, you know, we've been running the Bob Arum story about how, you know, his dad sold his dog and how he ate nothing and he was this that and the other but you were there first hand and you sent and you had a good look at it it's all true is it yeah it is it is all true i mean and you i i talked to quite a people quite a few people in his hometown um who knew him as a kid and uh it, it was interesting to talk to those folks because they they would they would tell me that and they were really poor and they would tell me how poor pacquiao was so oh. um you know among among the, the, these people living in abject poverty was was a kid who was was even poorer than them. And the interesting thing about Pacquiao that they always would tell me was that even when he was you know had was hungry or was was doing without, if he had something extra, he would always um, give it give it to other people. So a, a, a generous a generous man. You know, uh, that, those are the stories since, since that he was a young boy. You know, those are the stories we've been running for a long time now, and and it just seems to me that uh, what your book does is it it, it fills in and um, validates all of that stuff because you obviously went out there, did your research, and spoke to people, and it turns out 
all that stuff we'd been running and thinking, nah, it can't, it can't all be true. Surely he didn't give up his last fish bone when he hadn't eaten for two days. But it turns out he did. Quite staggering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people would come up to me and tell these stories, and 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 uh, and I and I went out, and I was, you know, I'd go out and like uh, these these jungles in 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 the southern Philippines, and you know, people people knew him, and and would would describe this stuff to me. I mean, it's 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 the Philippines is a is a is a poor country, and in the southern Philippines, it's particularly poor. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, also a pretty violent place too. So he, you know, it was it was it was tough where he where he where he grew up, and his father, um, you know, he, he w wasn't around, and so he really had to take a lot of responsibility um, for his family. I mean, you know, as you, as you probably know, he left school at, at sixth grade and was on the streets um, selling things. Uh, to to try to support his family, so he, he he you know those 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 stories are are true, and I think I I think by going there and really digging into them though, and 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 giving giving people uh, I give people kind of a picture of it that, yeah. that you wouldn't know just from hearing you know the rags to riches kind of cliches. So when's the point then when you're talking to him and you're you're going through his early career? When is it that he becomes the Manny Pacquiao, the Pac Man? that we know now. When does he think that point happened? When does well, he think, think he became it, a superstar? I think it really happened after he lost to, to Eric Morales. I mean he 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 was he was on an upward trajectory but he was he was really a, a one dimensional fighter. Uh, and then he then he then he had that big loss and he went back into the gym and, and started working on his on his his defense you know his defense isn't great, yeah. but he he worked started working on his defense, and particularly he was working on his right hand. So he became a he became a, a person with two dangerous with two dangerous punches, two di dangerous hands. So um, uh, I think that's when he really started his 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 climb um, that that sort of transcended. Um, uh, the boxing ranks, if if, if you get my direct. Uh, do indeed. What, what what does he say about those early years? You know those flyweight title fights. It just seems so long ago. It's almost like, well, physically it is a different man. It's almost like it was a different time. I mean, going back to what you know, nineteen ninety. Does he ever talk about those fights and, and that part of his life, that flyweight part of his life? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a crazy time. I mean, he yeah. he he. he came up to Manila. Oh, well, I mean, first of all, he was doing these fights down in, in in the southern Philippines, which were, you know, they would take him out into the out into the jungle, and they would do these kind of jungle fights, uh, and he and he would, you know, make a couple dollars so he well, could feed his family out, out, for a outside, week. outside, not even in arenas. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. And wow. then he got, then he sort of graduated to these Sunday fights uh, in his in his hometown. And then you know he he sort of was destroying everybody and uh, knew that if he was going to make any any real money or make really any big impact, he had to go to Manila. So he went up to Manila, um, and he he was he was doing these sort of neighborhood fights. And then a, sh a television show came about called Blow to Blow B Blow by Blow. Yeah. And he really wanted to get on this show, and so he lied about his age and turned pro. And his style was so exciting that it really captivated people pretty pretty quickly um, because he was just, you know, like just laid it out there all the time. Yeah, put it out there on the line. And he was exciting. He was exciting. He wasn't technically as, you know, a lot of windmill kind of punches, and he wasn't as technically good as he is now, obviously. Uh, but he was exciting. He was still exciting. Was exciting to how, how does he deal with his riches, Gary? I mean, he's not just rich by normal standards he's, he's outrageously rich by filipino standards how does he deal with that i mean uh, what does he i mean how how you know how does he manage to conceal the wealth if he's a such a fighter of the people i mean it's um well, he, he, gives a, he, he gives a lot of it away uh i mean i've been i've seen lines and lines of people up to his house in the Phil, in, in the philippines and he he uh he they bring their medical bills and he pays for these medical bills um and a lot of other things 
he, you know, he, he lives a lifestyle. I mean, he has, he has nice cars and a house in Beverly Hills and um, a place in Manila and okay. that sort of thing. But, he, but, he, but he, he's really, I have to say, um, really about sort of giving, giving, his, giving his money away. I mean, people have, you know, I've talked to Freddie Roach, his trainer, about it, and he's like, oh, the thing that I worry about is him giving it all giving away it all because he tends to. He tends to like give it away, wow. uh, what a, what and a lot of people take it. You know, of course they do. Now, that's one of the things I'm going to ask you now. How does he deal with the, shall we say, the less scrupulous people in the Philippines, a country infamous for its um, trickeration, skullduggery, and corruption? How does he deal with being surrounded <laughs> by so many of those people? <laughs> no, I mean, you said it, not me. You said it, not me. But yeah, I said it, not you. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I I asked him about it directly, and he had this very uh, zen-like uh, philosophy about it. And he he was basically like, "Hey, God, he's a very spiritual, religious person," mm-hmm. and he said, "Hey, God gave me this this bounty of wealth, and who am I to to um, to keep it?" And if somebody steals from me, they all have to answer to God. And I'm oh, sort wow. of like, "Oh, come on," but. He, I think he really believes that. Oh. Listen, Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. I'm sorry it's uh, so short. Uh, the book's called Pac-Man, Behind the Scenes of Manny Pacquiao, the greatest pound-for-pound fighter in the world. It's published by the Capo Press. The author is Gary Andrew Paul. But if you Google Pac-Man, Gary Andrew Paul's name will come up. It's 10.99. And if you listen to me on a regular basis, you'll know I don't endorse books that are garbage. It's proper. Gary Paul... Thanks so much. I'm gonna-